religious beliefs or lack of belief, you are welcome here. No matter your age, sex, sexual orientation or gender identity, you are welcome here. No importa tu ciudadanía, tu estás bienvenido aquí. No matter your citizenship, politics, or relationship status. No matter your physical characteristics or health, you are welcome here. Whoever you are, wherever you are from, you are welcome in this place. Good morning, and welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Montgomery online worship for Sunday, October 11, 2020. My name is Lynn Hopkins, and it is my honor to serve this congregation as its minister. As I light the chalice this morning, I would like to invite you into this hour of worship with words from the activist, poet, teacher, author, organizer, Adrian Murray Brown. I love the sky, most of the time I do when everything is too full and it seems we will not be able to do what it is we are here to do, that victory is impossible, that cruelty and greed and dominance will slowly tear us apart with ravenous teeth and swallow us broken and whole, when everyone and everything is more than I can handle or hold and I need no one to need any more of me, when there's only a sliver left that is pulsing and still longing, then, if I can remember, I look up. And this sky, full of wonders and terrors, keeps humbling me. Every heart in my lineage lived and died under this sky. It has always been impossible, but they lived the small lives that led to mine. And if it is impossible for me, for my people, for my species to go on, I know this sky will watch us come apart, will watch the earth rest over us, will watch 
Someday our bones come to light to startle some future stranger like dinosaur bones. Perhaps we will feed that future industry until the sun goes cold, and perhaps that will feel like justice or liberation. Or the sky will welcome us to go beyond atmosphere and ideology, survival and constant war, and the accumulation of belongings that never add up to enough to take only what we can lift beyond the reach of gravity, to take only the truth and use it to seed a new home. Or perhaps this sky will watch us become small and smaller, slower, to fall into her rhythm and sustenance, to submit to this heaven, to be satisfied. And knowing so little and feeling so much, these big thoughts make me feel small enough to breathe again, to laugh and argue and plan and look forward. These big thoughts, some days, are the only peace I know. I would like to invite those who wish to join me in speaking our congregational covenant. We, the members and friends of the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Montgomery, promise to serve our community with open minds, willing hearts, and helping hands as we respect one another, honoring that our perceptions may differ, value our differences, working to better understand them in conflict, give joyfully of ourselves being in harmony with our capabilities and embrace our connections with each other, nature, the global community, and the great mystery of life. And now we welcome our coordinator of religious education, Roger Burdett, for a time for all ages. You hear that? I had the excellent privilege of growing up on this property. This is in Chilton County. My mother still lives here. One of the things I remember fondly about this place is this time of year, maybe a little bit later in the fall, you hear crows. In fact, as I drove out here today for this video shoot, I saw some crows and I've been hearing them. We might even hear some while I'm shooting this video. Crows and water. That is the focus of today's Time for All Ages. So today we are pulling a story out of the Book of Virtues, and they are allowing us to use these stories on our videos. So the story today is The Crow and the Pitcher, an Aesop fable. There are some introductory text. This is the famous fable from Aesop which tells us that where there's a will, accompanied by practical intelligence, there's a way. So let's find out what this crow did. Once there was a thirsty crow. She had flown a long way looking for water to drink. And suddenly she saw a pitcher. She flew down and she saw it held a little bit of water. But the water was so low that she couldn't reach it. It was too far down in the pitcher. But I must have that water, she cried. I am too weary to fly any further. What shall I do? I know. I'll tip the pitcher over. So she beat it with her wings, but it was too heavy. She could not move the pitcher. And then she thought a while longer, and she said, Ah, 
I know now I will break it. And then I'll drink the water as it pours out. Oh, it's going to taste so good. With beak and claws and wings, she threw herself against the pitcher, but it was too strong. The poor crow stopped to rest. I heard a crow just then. It sounds like it's way out there, or way out yonder, as we might have said here on the farm. Well, after a while, the crow had a bright idea. There were many small stones lying about, so she picked them up one by one. She dropped them into the pitcher, and slowly the water rose, until finally, at last, she could drink the water. It tasted so good. There's always a way out of hard places, said the crow, if only you have the wit to find it. Now we're going to accompany today's story with a science experiment. Really? Really, Aesop? Can you really raise the level of water in a pitcher by dropping stones inside the pitcher? Well, you can see for yourself. I dropped some stones into this pitcher and eventually the water level rose. And check this out. It's true, apparently. Aesop was right. Birds use rocks to raise water level. I found this article in discovermagazine.com and it says that sure enough, there are some birds that are closely related to crows who have used rocks to raise the water level. A quartet of clever rooks R-O-O-K-S, have provided evidence that one of Aesop's fables could have a basis in fact. The tale in question tells a story about a thirsty crow, but you already know that story because that was our time for all ages today. I hope you use your wit and have a really great week. So it's October 11th. Yesterday, October 10th, was a lot of things. It was my spouse Carolyn's birthday. It was World Day Against the Death Penalty. And it was also National Mental Health Day. And so on that note, I just want to add this contribution from the Ad Council to remind us. you rise, this is where you shine, this is where you become the greatest of all time, history in the making, this is history in the making, history in the making, vote for your life. Carolyn and I have confirmation that our votes have been received, how about you? I regard voting as an act of sacred nature, a, a spiritual practice, a religious duty. Next week, you'll hear a lot more on that topic. We're going to share some worship materials from the UU The Vote Project of the Unitarian Universalist Association. But for now, it's not about the election. It's not about all the politics swirling around us, all the unanticipated catastrophes and astonishments. For now, it's about Mental Health Day, our individual and collective well-being. So let's take a moment, as we do in most of our services, to share our joys and concerns. It's a practice in which we lift up and let go the things we carry with us during the week. And it's been one hell of a week in our nation and a tumultuous time in the lives of many of us as well. Meg Hall had emergency eye surgery this past week. She's recovering well, prognosis is good, but she can't say how long it'll be before she can drive again, so that's frustrating. Our hearts 
go out to her as she recovers. And I want to offer my gratitude to Simone Thomas, who collected donations of supplies from some of our members yesterday for delivery to the Capitol Heights School. She is driving this effort to make sure they have adequate supplies for cleaning to ensure a safe environment for the kids gathering in the classroom. What's weighing on you? What hurts right now? What gives you gratitude or hope? Use the chat to share so that we can be together as a people in this moment of communal prayer with and for ourselves and each other. Spirit of light, come unto me, sing in my heart all the stirrings of compassion. Oh, prepared for service today, my mind kept returning to a meditation practice that I picked up from the work of Thich Nhat Hanh, the founder of the Order of Interbeing. I found it many years ago, and it continues to sustain and encourage me, particularly in times of stress. Now, I usually avoid any kind of guided meditation in worship. A lot of my colleagues do it all the time, and I've just never liked it. Uh, maybe it's because it almost always seems hokey. Or maybe because when it's not hokey, it feels too vulnerable for public worship. Or maybe it's because my first experience with guided meditation as a technique was during inpatient psychiatric treatment. Whatever the reason, I always prefer to invite you to come with me on the journey of the sermon by your own path rather than under my direction. But I do want to give you a taste of this practice. So join me for just a few minutes, if you will. And imagine in your mind's eye a mountain. This one is Pike's Peak. Maybe you have one you like better, that you have seen or that you've just made up in your head. It, it doesn't matter what mountain, but imagine a majestic mountain. See its enormity, its permanence. Its surface is marked by millennia of weather, making some parts more jagged and some smoother. Water and wind may alter its surface, but its substance remains solid rock. Even seismic events underground may send tremors through it, but they cannot bring it down. Look deeply into your mountain. Solid. Even if sometimes scarred, sometimes trembling, always solid. And so, as we consider this mountain, the practice is to say, breathing in, I am the mountain. Breathing out, I am solid. Continue slowly and gently taking natural breaths, breathing in, 
I am the mountain breathing out. I am solid. Continue until you feel it deep down and believe it. And then 10 more times, just so you remember. the base of the mountain. Imagine a pond. The air has a slight aroma of wildflowers and tall grass as the dragonflies flit. The water is still and so perfectly clean that it reflects light like a mirror. As you look across the surface of the water, you can see the face of the mountain reflected in it. As you take in its beauty, Look deeply into the pond to see its serene nature. And repeat as you breathe in, I am the pond. As you breathe out, I am calm. As you breathe in, I am the pond. As you breathe out, I am calm. And again, continue until you can feel it and believe it. And then 10 more times. At the edge of the pond where the water washes at the soil. See in the muddy shallow water a lotus flower. Lotus flowers hold special symbolism in many belief systems because they close up and retreat down under the surface overnight. In the morning they emerge from the mud in which they thrive and they open perfectly clean and simply beautiful in their symmetry. Their stems are hollow inside but have a rock hard outer coating that stands up to all sorts of harsh weather, swaying but always unbroken. The lotus tells us of starting over, beginning fresh with each new day, washed clean, offering a glorious pastel face of soft petals reaching up to the sun. Look deeply into the lotus flower and see through its glorious beauty into its deep nature. See yourself in the flower and say with me, breathing in, I am the flower. Breathing out, I am beautiful. Breathing in, I am the flower. Breathing out, I am beautiful. Breathing in, I am the flower. Breathing out, I am beautiful. Say it over and over with each breath. Continue until you know it 
and then keep on saying it because you will forget. I opened with a poem from Adrienne Murray Brown, and I would like to offer a few words of her prose. This is from Emergent Strategy. Do you already know that your existence, who and how you are, is in itself a contribution to the people and place around you? Not after or because you do some particular thing, but simply the miracle of your life. And the people around you and the place have contributions as well. Do you understand that the quality of life and do you understand that your quality of life and your survival are tied to how authentic and generous those connections are between you and the people and place you live with and in? Are you actively practicing generosity and vulnerability in order to make the connections between you and others clear, open, available, durable? Generosity here means giving of what you have without strings or expectations attached. And vulnerability means showing your needs. Adrienne Murray Brown is with, without a doubt one of the most influential and inspirational writers of this time of rising organizers and activists, new leadership coming in these extraordinary circumstances. Adrian Murray Brown has written a number of books. Each one speaks in a voice particular to the moment. And so I want to talk a little bit about what she has offered to me. She addresses among so many other things, the practice of healing. We all come broken. First, of course, healing is not fixing, but rather she points to it as, as a, a reopening of the places within us that have closed. 
they're closed to protect us. They're closed for good reason, to carry us through and allow us to endure particular trials and traumas. We do not fault ourselves because they, because they are closed, but we learn to reopen them in a new way. Inviting these parts of us to allow light in. And it is a new way. It takes time, intention, vulnerability. Like a child who wants through tantrums to get their way, but now is matured enough that the child can use words to say what they need. It can take us a while and a good bit of effort to learn how to skillfully use this new ability of opening up. And, and the process of healing and of emerging with our full selves in authenticity, generosity, and vulnerability can be so terrifying that most of us avoid it for most of our lives. It's a, it's a pitfall especially inviting to activists, but also to therapists and professionals of all types find their way. You see, the pitfall is projecting or redirecting our need for change onto the people and systems outside, around us, to spend our energies working to correct the conditions that we see around us as a way of avoiding facing ourselves. And for this reason, the very first step to healing is always allowing ourselves to be seen by others, to be known. Being seen and welcomed is the very first step in the healing process. It begins to loosen our resistance to loving ourselves as we are, rather than looking at ourselves as well as others, but especially ourselves. Looking at ourselves in a way that is oriented to finding fault, finding things that need correction. The first step is showing up and allowing ourselves to be seen as we are, because only then can we experience being loved as we are, which allows us then to love others as they are, rather than making our love contingent on something. When you allow yourself to be truly seen, this amazing thing happens. You realize what was in that paragraph from Adrian Murray Brown that I just read. It comes to you that your very existence, who you are and how you are, in itself is a contribution to those around you. Not what you do or what you produce, but your very being and presence. And only then can we truly experience that love. We're acculturated to believe that, that love, that, that the truest form of love is all about exclusive attachment, belonging to just one person or one identity or one ideology, that we must constrain and conform ourselves in order to continue belonging so that our lives continue to have meaning. 
we're also taught that your value comes from what we produce, what we can do, what we can make. So, so truly showing up for our own lives, practicing the authenticity and embracing the terrifying vulnerability that that entails turns all of this on its head. We begin to cast off this notion from deep down within us that our value is derived from what we can make or do, how much we write or publish, what we leave to our children. We begin to cast off this notion that we must be bound exclusively to one other identity, organization, ideology, person, without which our life ceases to have its essence. But it's so terrifying because truly it turns our entire understanding of how we fit in the universe upside down. It's so terrifying that very few of us can even begin to try it unless we feel as though we've lost everything we had to lose. That's one reason I, I always feel a little sorry for people who have not been destroyed by addiction and had to venture into an entirely new way of living. Not to say that everyone who loses everything, actually launches a new way of living. Not everyone ventures into authenticity, generosity, and vulnerability, but I can testify that for those who do, it is worth any loss. Healing, not, not fixing or repairing, but healing is often slow and painful and bewildering. Healing is not simply restoration. It is not refinement or self-improvement. It takes us into places we did not know existed and we would not have sought if we knew but with authenticity and vulnerability, it makes life possible in ways we otherwise would never have imagined. So, let us take this season to be still, to open up, to look deeply. Let us dare ourselves to show up broken or angry or fearful, if that is what we are in the moment, to show up authentically and let us listen for the lessons life is trying to teach us now, embracing our connectedness, our interdependence, our mutuality. We can do this and find joy in it together. May it be so. Breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. When I breathe in, I breathe in peace. When I breathe out, I breathe out love. When I breathe in, when I breathe in, I breathe in peace. When I breathe out, when I breathe out, I breathe out love. When I breathe in, when I breathe in, I breathe in peace. When I breathe out, when I breathe out, I breathe out. I breathe out, I 
breathe out love. Breathe in, breathe out. Breathe in, breathe out. So come on over to Zoom for second hour discussion. The gathering we had hoped for at the park, at Oak Park today is not going to happen. Probably couldn't have because of the weather, but since Meg Hall is uh, unable to drive, that's called off for today. Watch your email. Last night I sent one out that has uh, some important upcoming events in it. Join us on Wednesday evening for You, You, and You. We have started the principles. We uh, talked about the first principle last week, and so we will look at the second principle of the UUA covenant this week. Come out and join us. Drop-ins are always welcome. And until then, our service has ended. May our service begin. For each child that's born, a morning star rises and sings to the universe who we are. For each child that's born, a morning star rises and sings to the universe who we are. Oh, for each child that's born, a morning star rises and sings to the universe who we are. Oh, for each child that's born, a morning star rises and sings to the universe who we are. We are our grandmother's prayers, and we are our grandfather's dreamings, and we are the breath of our ancestors. We are the spirit of God. We Mothers of courage, fathers of time, daughters of dust, and the sons of great visions. We're sisters of mercy, brothers of love, lovers of life, and the builders of nations. We're seekers of truth, keepers of faith, makers of peace, and the wisdom of ages. We are our grandmother's prayers we are our grandfather's dreamings and we are the breath of our ancestors we are the spirit of god we are mothers of courage fathers of time daughters of dust and the sons of great visions we're sisters of mercy brothers of love lovers of life and the builders of nations we're seekers of truth and keepers of faith we are makers of peace and the wisdom of ages we are our grandmother's prayers we we are our grandfather's dreamings and we are the breath of our ancestors. We are the spirit of God. We are our grandmother's prayers and we are our grandfather's dreamings. We are the breath of our ancestors. We the spirit of God for each child that's born. A morning star rises and sings to the universe who we are. For each child that's born, a morning star rises and sings to the universe who we are. We are one.